I mean, at least at least we can see each other now, which is <laughs> we can engage a bit more, a bit more naturally. Um, but yeah, Ayen, it is it is such a pleasure to have you on the Alpha Zen podcast. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. Thank you. Um, so diving straight in, um, uh, I wanted to to sort of give a little bit of context into into the problem area for um, our conversation today. Um, the first, uh, rather, before we do that, though, I thought it might be useful just to uh, give a little insight into who you are and what your company is all about, um, just in case someone hasn't uh, hasn't heard about it before. So, if you could just, yeah. like, tell me a little bit about SendCloud. Like, what problem does it solve? Yeah, so SendCloud started about eight years ago, where uh, the three founders uh, ran a web shop in smartphone uh, related products and um, what they found a challenge is that uh, every night when they processed all the orders they had to print all the labels for the carrier so in the netherlands it's post and l but in the uk it would be royal mail or germany deutsche post um, and that was quite uh, labor intensive and as they got more successful it was really a lot of work so they decided to create a software solution for that where they could just yeah, basically hit the button and print all the, the shipping labels for all these orders uh, uh, using the API of the Dutch postal company. And that saved them a lot of work and that made them think like, hey, so we retrieve the orders from our web shop and we call the API of the carrier and we automatically print it. So that's when they thought, why not stop with the web shop? and sell that piece of software as a SaaS product. And also connected to many other shopping platforms like Magento, WooCommerce, Amazon.com, eBay, and also connect to other carriers so that you can also choose other. And that's when they founded SendCloud. And that's the, at the end still the problem it solves. There's a lot more added value to it in terms of order processing, analytics, returns, track and trace, that kind of stuff. But in the core, it's still that problem. And it's a problem solved really well. Yeah, and I guess I mean that's I was going to ask what what makes that particular problem um, like interesting or hard for you, but I think yeah. that that speaks to that is that is is trying to do it, you know, even though the the core complexity is uh, is not yeah I mean the, the core function is not that complex, but at scale, um, and I like yeah. that idea of trying to keep that day one feeling. Yeah. So if you so for for one shop and one carrier, it's easy. Yeah, with for or even you know, regardless, SendCloud. So any other company yeah. I work for, I've worked at like past ten years in multiple size and e-commerce companies, and it's it's always easier when you are, for example, a team of four. Um, but then if you hire another four, so you grow from four to eight, um, you but you don't get twice the output. It's like yeah. one, it's one point eight the output. And so if you then grow from 8 to 16, it might become 1.7 or 1.6. So your output in terms of speed of delivery. So with four people, you don't are, you're not twice as fast as with two. It's just 1.8 as fast. Mean, and, and, and also stability. So you deliver more and uh, it's harder to run it stable in production, which is also something that customers want. And um, so the speed and stability, which are then the two major things you offer as a tech organization to your company or to your customers, that is harder to, that's, yeah, that's, that if you do that well, then you can keep on doing it at a large scale. And that's, I think, the big challenge. Yeah. Right. And then how big is your um, company? And maybe also specifically, like, how big is your engineering team? Yeah. So the company is just over 200 people and the engineering team is, Actually, as of today, 46. Yesterday it was 40, but today, for the <laughs> month, uh, six new people joined. Um, cool. So that's uh, that's nice. So we're in 46 now, and currently the engineering team is growing a bit faster than the rest of the company. So we're, uh, uh, yeah, that the percentage of people in engineering is currently increasing as a to, compared to the rest. Yeah. And then I think everyone's titles change a little bit from company to company. So I was uh, wondering if you could just give a little insight into like what part you play um, in Send Cloud's mission as a as a VP of engineering. Also, yeah. what what some of your main responsibilities or how you define your role would be. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's it's, uh, most easy to explain by comparing it to the CTO role, where I'm VP of Engineering. Um, so uh, my colleague Tim is uh, CTO of SendCloud. Uh, his emphasis is very much on architecture, technology, and platform infrastructure. My emphasis is more on the software delivery uh, and people management, organization, people development. Um, and um, I think both of us could do the other guy's work. It's just that for me, the emphasis is on one, for him, the emphasis on the other. And um, it's also, at least for me and for him as well, I think is like that's where we leverage the strength uh, more. Um, so at the end, um, uh, yeah, my, of course, I run a technology team. So technology is important. Um, my emphasis is more on delivery and people development. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, I think that's a, a really cool, a really cool place to double click on the people development aspect. Cause you know, as a, as a leader of an engineering team, um, and I think you've, you've been a coach as well for a number of years in that regard. Um, and you've defined your role, as you've just said, as caring about delivery people development. So something which I think, um, we've spoken of before and that you've realized a lot of tech managers, uh, out there are, or that they're really quick to judge a bad developer. Um, and your approach has always been to first ask, like, what is it that you as a leader have done uh, wrong or incorrectly um, as an engineering leader? And how, how have you set up the environment um, yeah. to, I guess, disable people from doing their best? And I think that's been key to how you get the most out of people. Um, and that's really the, the sort of crux of our conversation today. So I'd love to understand some of your approaches to yeah. doing that more effectively. But yeah. just before we dive into that, uh, that practical approach. Um, tell me a little bit more about your experience leading a dev team and getting the most out of your dev team. Um, and maybe we can start with just explaining what you mean by getting the most out of a team means to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's multiple sides to that, I think. So getting most out of the team is, um, yeah, there's like, I think, two two major parts in this. One is uh, like the motivation of the people. So um, um, how do you get more out of the team than like anybody else would get, for example? So that's where, uh, yeah, you could for you could compare it to like a Formula One racing car where, you know, if you give exactly the same car to two drivers, one driver probably gets more out of it than the other. What is it? That's probably, you know, skills or experience or whatever. There's something to it that makes that person get more out of the same horsepower, basically. So that's interesting to dive into later as well. Like, what is it that one manager gets more out of the team than another one? Why do certain people get more motivated with one manager over another? The other aspect of uh, getting most out of a team is the if you would ask your stakeholders of your or your customers, so um, are they happier than they were a couple of months ago? You know, maybe you decided to improve a few things or change your style, or do they now feel that they get more value for money? Basically, with the same, that's also a part of getting most out of the team. So, of course, people development is important. It's uh, great if people feel like it's a great place to work that they're very much engaged that they can contribute to problem solving. At the end, the stakeholders also need to feel like that benefits them, of course, because if you would ask them, are you happy? Uh, are you better off than you were six months ago? And they say no, well, then there's still something wrong. Can you maybe just make that link clear? Because I think um, it's interesting that you talk about the what, the stakeholders. It almost feels like there's an internal um, internal aspect to this, where it's how can you get the most out of the like the, the the physical people in your team, whether it's like how motivated they are, um, how how much they develop in your team, um, but that that external factor of like your stakeholders, your customers, like what is why is that such a uh, why is that so important for this idea of people development? Well, at the end, if um, you know, you can make you make it you can make it a great place to work, but at the end, you also need to run a business, of course, uh, so. Um, um, it would be easy, it would be actually very easy if you don't have to consider stakeholders and customers. And it would be very easy to make the development, the NCD is happy because you 
could just like almost make a permanent hackathon or something, you know, like do whatever you want, but that's not how you run a business. At the end, we have a, we are here to solve a problem for customers. The customers pay for it. They want, you know, they pay on a monthly basis. So they want monthly innovation in return. That's like a statement that Satya Nadella of Microsoft made, uh, like I think one or two years ago, when they moved to the service business, you want, you want to offer monthly innovation for in return for the monthly subscription so that customers really value it. So, um, yeah, if you don't do that, so if you, if customers don't value it or internal stakeholders like sales or customer service who work a lot with these customers, if they don't see the value in what the team, the engineering team does, yeah, then, uh, then that's an, uh, basically an existential problem for the software team anyway. So you, that's why you need to have, uh, both basically. Yeah. You cannot just only focus on happy people. Yeah. It's it's interesting as well that the and that this is why I like the analogy you use so much about the F one driver because it's it's the same car in both situations but what what makes the difference is you as the driver or you as the leader, um, but in those situations where for example customers or stakeholders are unhappy, it's very easy to just look at your dev team and say somebody made a mistake or somebody's not working hard enough, um, which is is exactly the thing that you're uh, you're trying to see a little differently. Um, yeah. So I like I like that the you use the users as a as a measure um, rather than a uh, I guess like a, a, a what's the word like a success metric or something like it's it's just a way to measure whether you are doing your job as a leader correctly as opposed to whether or not your dev team did the thing correctly. Yes. Yeah. 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 The thing is that. Um um if you make it's a, you can actually like um solve both in one go because if you if you make sure that the engineers have the feeling like they have a, a good purpose they are involved in they're involved in defining the solution to a problem so you ask them to solve a problem and you don't ask them to build a feature without understanding the context and uh, you help them personally develop then they will get highly motivated and automatically these customers will start seeing that of course one way or the other so if you take care of the people the people take care of the customer so i personally don't have to take care of the customer anymore if you do it that way so that's why primarily i take care of the people of course i keep an eye on do we solve problems for these customers and then i ask challenging questions to people but for me, automatically, the customer happiness comes from the employee happiness, but it's in that order. First, employees happy and, uh, yeah, we're going really fast and doing good things. Then the customer happiness comes from that. And you still need to ask them. So I still ask stakeholders, like how things are going, but you will definitely see, see a relationship between the two. I would love you to hold that thought for now. Um, I'm going to dive into the practical, practical things, and I think that's that's touching on some of that stuff really well. But yeah. what you're highlighting, and I wanted to um, spend a little time just explaining that in a bit more detail, is that, or at least the the importance that environment plays in uh, in how well your team works, but specifically how well the right environment that you create as a manager um, or how well you create that environment so just as an idea like what is when when you speak about environment and i know we've we've spoken about this in our in our previous chat so i just wanted to unpack it here like when you say environment what do you see what do you mean um so yeah that's also like yeah that's a that's a pretty pretty big term so there's also different aspects i think Part of the environment is uh, uh, the the team you work in, um, the development opportunities you offer, uh, the customers who have needs, um, the management team of the company, the way we manage teams. Um, it's um, the way of working, the technology stack, like architecture technology stack. It's all part of an environment that you create that can be more or less motivating for people and uh, for example yeah the the management style the leadership style is highly influencing i think how motivated people are um maybe it starts with that 
um, often technology choices are a result maybe of that, but uh, also the technology stack in which you work can also define how much motivating it is to work in a certain organization. So environment is a probably pretty broad term and yeah, you can cover all these different parts. Yeah. So what is like, well, when we say create a good environment or a great environment, like a great environment for what? What is the the, the thing that you're trying to create a yeah. good environment for? Yeah, so if you, if you take, for example, the leadership style as one part of the environment that highly influences all the other parts, like technology choices, way of working, uh, and so forth. Um, so if you, if you would like, Tell, tell people what to do. So you, you, for example, ask them for a feature instead of a problem to solve, or you ask them to solve something in a certain language with a certain database. And like, you know, all the decisions have been made, just go ahead, do it. Um, that's, that has a few problems. It's very much not motivating for these people because they're not involved in creating the solution. So, as a result, they also don't learn from making mistakes because somebody else makes the decision. I don't know what that guy was thinking. He as a manager made the decision. I'm doing it. If it doesn't work out that well, what were actually the other options and why didn't we choose them? You were not involved in it. So you don't make any mistakes or you don't learn so much. That's one part of it. That's why I would prefer to set clear goals. So give people a purpose set goals, like this is what we want to achieve, a certain problem to solve. Agree on some principles, and it could be principles like, uh, let's make things scalable and performant so that it doesn't just work today, but also it works when we have 10 times more customers. Um, another principle could be a way of working, like we don't do big things that take six months to release, but we want to do small tests and release it as soon as possible and verify whether it works or not and then tweak the direction a bit. These kinds of principles. So you set these goals and you give some principles that together you agree upon and then let the people choose the practices themselves. And that can be practices like a technology choice, can be practices like a way of working, whether you want to do Scrum or SAFE whatever it's I personally don't care that much about these practices as long as people achieve their goals and we agree on some principles like for example we're not going to build bikes or airplanes we're a sand cloud we're doing shipping so as long as it's on that then we're fine um, and that highly motivates people because they can make the choices as a team um, and there's a lot of good side effects of this because it also makes the organization scale much more um like i said with the with growing from the two to four people and that you only have one point eight the output and you go from 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 eight to sixteen and it's only one point five the output that's also because because if you are managing in a very directive way in the, on practice level yeah, then you're managing in very much detail and that costs a lot of time and everybody's waiting for you to make a decision. Um, so then basically people are working in sequence, you know, they do something, you need to approve something and so forth. It's highly demotivating and it slows down. Well, if you set the context with the goals and the principles and you leave the decision, you push the decision making downwards, it's highly motivating. People learn faster, but it also scales much better because if we have 10 teams in the future, and today we have three teams at 10 Cloud, next year we'll pick them up in six, maybe later we'll move to 12. Um, if we keep on working the way we do now, we're setting the context and, and the goals and the principles and leave the, the, the detailed decisions up to the teams, it scales out very easily. It's almost like software, but then an organizational uh, model. So this idea of and I think you've almost answered it, but I just want to see if I can um, paraphrase or highlight it, mm -hmm. is why, like, isn't it just enough if the dev team is told to build a feature and it works, like the business is going to carry on as opposed to putting all this extra effort into giving them a problem to solve and like letting them choose their tech stack. Like if you as a leader can say, build this feature and it works, why, why put in the effort? Um, and 
having having listened to you speak now, I think the the key difference there is like your role as a manager becomes a lot more difficult if you're only working in this like short term cycle of like just do this feature, just do this feature. Yeah. Whereas if you put in those principles and think about like giving teams uh, problems um, as opposed to just features, then your and I think you said this nicely earlier, you have to worry less about the end user or the stakeholders because it's it's you're, you're thinking a lot more long term. You're thinking about yeah. like when your team scales, when your yeah. team grows, when your team needs to run on its own, like if you're sick for a week or whatever, like all of those things can still function. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that because I think I think a lot of people might say, yeah. but if, if I just give a feature and it works, why, yeah. why put in all that extra effort? Yeah, so there's two things that I've come up in my mind now one about the being not there being sick and then so and, and the other one about you know the feature and asking the team for a feature it's highly unlikely that my ideas or one person's idea whether it's maybe a ceo or a product manager it's highly unlikely that one individual always has the great ideas it's much more likely that the whole team the diverse team um yeah that from that team come better ideas if they work together and talk about it. And then when one individual comes up with an idea, there's some exceptions to it. Like the most famous one is probably Steve Jobs. Yeah, like most likely something like an iPad or... He's allowed it's, though. He, he gets a free pass. Yeah, have his idea. That's but cool. that's <laughs> an exception. So it makes no sense to organize your organization such that there's one product manager deciding that we're going to be the build the next iPad kind of thing because forget it, it's not going to happen. The, we're not as creative as a visionary as some yeah. exceptional individuals in the world. So it's the chances that you get great ideas are higher if you discuss the problem to be solved together. Does it take much more time? Um, I don't think so. You know, on the short term, so it looks like it's slower up front, but then it gets faster also in terms of outcome. So, so what are the results for a customer? Because I think if one individual all the time comes up with features, then many more will fail than when collectively we discuss like, hey, what are we actually trying to solve for who? And is it worth building or not? And uh, then, yeah, that might take some time up front. But then if we apply some principles, like, hey, make it small, uh, define a hypothesis and measure whether, you know, whether that's correct or not, and get feedback as soon as possible. And at the end, the chances are much higher that you have a successful solution to an actual problem instead of one individual coming up with features. The other thing is that, you, yeah, as a, to, to make things scale, just like with software, you don't want to have bottlenecks. Because then you get kind of diminishing returns. You know, if you, if everybody's waiting for something, uh, whether it's uh, deployment of software or approval from a manager, but also in this case, some brilliant individual coming up with an idea, that doesn't scale. Because then today two teams are dependent on that individual. Tomorrow four teams, uh, even later ten teams. So you also want to distribute that and. Um, uh, yeah, at the end, the best, um, I think if you really run it well as a leader, as a manager, you at the end make yourself kind of redundant on the short term, so to say. I think if you do this and you would leave, then on the long term, the organization will miss that style, of course. Uh, but on the short term, yeah, there's really no issue if you're not there because you, the teams are self-organizing. Teams are involved in defining solutions to problems. The principle is that you can't make big projects, but you should slice it into smaller pieces that you learn from as soon as possible. And then there's also not much that can go wrong because things will go wrong, but it's because of the principle, it's only a small step to go wrong. And then we learn from that. And yeah, you could basically step away. And, and uh, the good thing, or you personally as a leader, is that allows you to focus on the long term. So your job really becomes thinking about long term stuff, and you're not very much thinking about short term things anymore, like feature ABC to be delivered. So it's much better for yourself as well. 
So I just want to I just want to use this to uh, pull on a, a thread that we mentioned earlier. This idea of a great environment. I think two things that are standing out for me is one that well, if we talk about motivation as being present in a good environment, or a good mm-hmm. environment requires motivation. I think motivation in practice uh, looks or has two different um, two different ways that it works, and just based off what you said now, is the one is that everyone feels like they can contribute great ideas um that that is like a a key part of a great environment where everyone is giving ideas and it's not just one person who makes has to come up with all of those ideas and the other one and this is probably a little bit closely more closely tied to leadership style is that you make yourself uh, you set things up in a way that you are trying as if you were trying to make yourself redundant so that teams can work on their own teams have their own principles that they adhere to that there aren't yeah. any bottlenecks and yeah. i think why that ties into motivation so nicely is there's a sense of ownership it's not it's not always being told what to do or always needing like i first need to speak to my team leader in order to know what to do or i first need to ask this person for permission before i know what to do um and that those two things are pretty critical in this idea of a great environment um, and I think I'd like to use use that to dive into some of the things that you've already said about how you can do that, or how you do that um, in your day to day and in your own team. Um, and I think the, I mean, we, we can touch on things that we haven't spoken about, but the two which I'd like to uh, start with, the one being uh, this idea of creating principles in your team, um, and the other being giving uh, giving your team a problem as opposed to just a, a solution or a feature. So when it comes to the principles, like very specifically, what kind of principles do you uh, think are helpful for this idea of uh, motivation and getting the most out of your team? Um, I think you mentioned scalability, but like, how do you how how do you set that up practically? Is it a, a and, and yeah, maybe I'll just leave it at that for now. Yeah. But, well, what does that look like in practice? Well, what, what do the principles look like? Um, well, it can be on, on different domains. So, for example, in the way of working, we could quite easily say, like, yeah, we we would like to apply the agile principles. So, I'm not asking people to do Scrum or to do Safe or whatever, as long as we stick to the agile principles. Important difference is that uh, uh, people can make their own decisions in the way of working. Um, and uh, I don't like to kind of tell people like, hey, you have to do safe or scrum uh, because then they start doing that just because that's a goal in itself. I prefer that people understand the principles so that they understand, hey, why do we do a daily send up? Why do we do a periodic retrospective? Why do we do alignment between teams? If people understand that, they can come up with all that with ceremony and practices themselves and do and come up with something that maybe looks a lot like Scrum but much, looks much better than, than we uh, uh, for, for us. Um, on the technical uh, part, you could uh, do like what you said, like scalability. So we want, we prefer horizontal scalability over vertical scalability. That doesn't mean that you can never do vertically scalable solutions, but if you do so, you need to have a really good reason for it. Uh, um, so, uh, or other principle could be like a, a for the uptime, uh, we uh, want APIs to be backward compatible or something we have released. Them. So, you know, that people can make all the decisions themselves, but it's a very important principle. Um, another one that we discussed recently is on the product management level, is that our principle is that we do uh, uh, global solutions over local solutions. So if we build a solution for uh, that works in multiple countries, it's much more valuable, of course. It's more, you know, the effort that we put into it is leads to solutions for many more customers than when we do something that only works for Dutch customers. And now, there is the same thing. We value global over local. That doesn't mean that we never do local because sometimes from a legal perspective or because it's a very country-specific issue, we do local. You just have to explain it really well. So if you, you can agree on these principles, and I'm not saying that we do that perfectly today, but we're moving towards them, where we set these principles, set the goals, and leave it up to people uh, to decide. And then, of course, 
people can then, uh, just like in the other scenario where you as a leader would make the choices for them, you will probably make a lot of bad choices. They will also make mistakes. And, uh, and that's, of course, a very critical moment because if at that moment you start to make a big problem because people make a mistake, yeah, then you lose that trust, of course. Then next time they will not be willing to have that freedom anymore. So you need to kind of give them the trust so that they can, you know, they need to feel like I can be kind of uh, vulnerable. So that what uh, Lencioni in his uh, principles on uh, a high-performing team describes as, you know, trust, vulnerability-based trust. People need to feel like, hey, I can go to my manager, discuss something that went wrong or discuss something that I just don't know and it doesn't impact my performance review or whatever. And then if people feel they can be vulnerable, then they trust you and they then it's not then you know then they will start um uh, performing even better if they don't feel like they can be uh, they don't trust you and they can be vulnerable yeah then they will not discuss issues with you and then you you're not learning as fast as a company so I think so just yeah. But just on that, like if, if, if someone makes a mistake or they make a bad decision and they come to you, how do you treat that? Like what do you do in your own, in your own leadership style? How, how do you navigate that situation? Um, I, I almost, yeah, I think I always, there's almost the best question to ask the people themselves, but I, the, what I have to do is, uh, is um, that I, yeah, that I understand that they made a mistake. And actually one of the first questions is like, or like, what did we learn here? But maybe even before that, often I, uh, because I've been in the business for quite a while as well, I almost always have a, an example of something where I made the same kind of mistake. Of course, I could have avoided them making the mistake by expl- by telling them what to do, but then they wouldn't learn that much, of course, because then they would just take it for granted and do it, and they don't know why it succeeded. But now they know why it failed, so they know why something else succeeds. Um, but so what I often do is even before I get into the question, like, what did we learn from it? How do we avoid that it happens another time? Is that I tell a story or explain how I had the same issue in the past? Because that then basically I make myself vulnerable. So I think a lot of leaders have a hard time uh, telling that they made mistakes. Maybe at least some will have that and, uh, and, and admit that also they did things that don't, that don't go well or still do. If you just explain like, hey, I had the same situation 10 years ago in that company, I totally screwed up, but and that's why I would have done it this way. Then you make yourself vulnerable and that then makes the people feel that they can be vulnerable as well and they can trust you. And, and then I also trust them that they're not, that they're open to me. And that's, if you do that, yeah, then uh, I think only then the model of setting the goals and the principles and leaving the details up to them, only then it works. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, as you said, the the value of having principles or these kinds of things explicated well is that people are more empowered to make decisions bef- instead of having to always ask someone first what to do. Yeah. Um, do you maybe have an example or a story from your team where having that principle actually ended up in that impact or um, just to sort of il- illustrate what that yeah. looked like um, in the past for you? Yeah, yeah. so um, one example is at a SaaS company where I used to work where when I joined, I saw in the uh, the annual review form that has like a, basically a checklist of things that they found important for engineers. Uh, they check like how did people develop their MySQL skills because we were running a MySQL a relational database. And I was thinking like, yeah, but maybe MySQL is just a solution that's not always the best solution for a problem. And if we start... Uh, um, yeah, if we start using that technology for any problem, then sooner or later we'll get issues. So what I changed there is that we got to the principle like we prefer horizontally scalable solutions over vertically scalable solutions. And another one was that we want for each database type, we want only one branch, so to say. 
So if you choose the relational database, yes, then we go for MySQL. However, it is also maybe not the best horizontally scaling solution there is. And in some cases, we might just need a document store because it serves documents a second, or we might yeah, need another type of database. So here the thing is that if you if they were if they, they needed the document store, they chose MongoDB, for example. And what then the principle was, okay, so for document store we choose MongoDB and not like a few other flavors, not that any other team comes up with another. So with relational databases, that one brand with document stores as one for search engines as one. But they all have their own purpose, so we're not sticking to only one database for the whole company. And that made that we became much more scalable and the performance was much better and also much more motivating because the engineers already knew that MySQL was not the best solution for every problem. Yeah. And then just diving uh, just diving into the uh, the other thing you mentioned about giving uh, giving teams a problem. Um, to solve as opposed to a solution. Can you just tell me a bit more about what that looks like in in practice? Um, like, what is that? Yeah, what, what, how how do you deliver that, or how do you practice that in your leadership? Yeah. Um, so the for technically, I find it uh, a bit easier than on a product management perspective. Uh, for example, technically, I could. Just give people, well, first of all, you involve them in defining the non-functional principles, for example, about scalability, availability, reliability, and so forth. And they, they know about it themselves probably much more than I do. So they can come up with the principles themselves and then let them choose. That's a very easy one because then, for example, what we do now, we host a session where we uh, look at our manifesto, as we called it, our development manifesto that basically contains all these principles. And then we ask people, like, if you look at the current solution landscape and you look at the manifesto, where do we not need it yet? So where do we have technical depth? Where do we maybe have things that might become depth in the future or things that work today but not tomorrow? Yeah, then we ask people to list these items and then we all, just like any business plan, we also try to make it as small as possible and improve uh, prove value as soon as possible and we put it on the backlog and they can execute on it and that's the technical part is always very concrete with the business part um, that also requires so the product management part that also requires a lot of collaboration with our business stakeholders and um, that makes it a bit more complex but what you could do for example is set uh, give each team a goal so uh, so we have for example a checkout team and it might be that uh, we uh, that the goal of the team would be help increase the conversion in the checkout for our customers. And then you know maybe sales or customer service people are from customer surveys. We get a lot of input like these are ways to help improve the conversion in the checkout. But maybe the software engineers also have ideas on helping improve the conversion in the checkout because they also are customers of online shops. So of course they know. Um, and then with all these different inputs, you can get to the right solution direction. And why is, so how does that tie into getting the most, getting the most out of your team? Um, and I think like we can also maybe speak to, or at least what it sounds like is, you know, if, if, if your team, if you're worried as a leader that your team is going to make bad decisions in those, uh, in those phases or those steps, um, it's actually probably because, as you said, you don't have, as a leader, you haven't helped your team outline those principles, which if you as a leader have done your job in those principles, your team shouldn't make bad decisions because they have what they need in order to make yeah. all the good decisions. Yeah. Um, but maybe you can just speak to, speak a bit more about why uh, giving, treating it as a, and I like the way you said it earlier, um, giving teams uh, problems as opposed to features. Um, how does that tie into helping helping uh, develop them and get the most out of that team? Um, yeah, so I, it, because you're basically engaging people much more in what we're solving for a customer. And that's at the end what we're doing. It's, of course, we're all as like engineers, we're very much like people who also love technology a lot. 
and uh, sometimes we run the risk of doing technology for the technology um, but we at the end we need to look at what are we trying to solve for a customer and yeah, if you engage them into the customer's problems if you share outcomes of surveys and that kind of stuff and you ask them to solve a problem based on that it's much more engaging and yeah that just leads to uh yeah, much more, yeah, like literally engage people, more happiness, um, the feeling of being able to make a difference, not having the feeling of just being an engineer who needs to do what's ordered. Um, and, and so, and yeah, these days with this type of work, it's also kind of creative work. There's not maybe one solution. We need to, there's just assumptions that certain solutions will work and we need to test them. And some of these solution directions or assumed solutions come from product management, some from customers themselves, and some from the team. And what we just want to do is verify these assumptions as soon as possible. It's totally different than, for example, factory work, where you would have a conveyor belt and people work there and do given tasks. That's a totally different way of managing. Here, yeah. So, I mean, do you say, do you, w w when you do that, is it is it the difference between saying, uh, I think we should do this, what do you think? Or is it first off immediately, like, a, what do you think we should do? Because um, I, th I think there's a difference yeah. there. It's like, instead yeah. of you as a leader saying, here is what I think we should do versus yeah, like, you're, giving yeah. them a clean slate. Yeah, if you do the first, then I must say it's tempting to do. And I might, I might sometimes do it as well. Um, because then I'm really convinced it's something. I want to do it quickly. And then you fall into the trap of saying, I think we should go left. And then, uh, but actually the question is like, hey, if we want to achieve, what do you think? Um, uh, because if you're, if you, if you say like, I think we should do this as a first, as a starter, right? Without explaining the problem, then some people are, um, um, independent thinkers enough to th say, hey, why do you want to do that? Let's take a step back and maybe this is a better solution. You should be happy if you have these people. Some people find it annoying, and then, but <laughs> you should actually be ha happy with these people. Um, because a lot of other people will just go with you because, yeah, maybe they have a hard time going against your opinion or, yeah. or they just think like, hey, the guy is like, has so much experience or is in that position so let's listen to him and yeah, you really don't want that because like what we discussed before the chances that one an individual has the best solution uh, over and over again are not that high and uh, so you really want to basically ask people for uh, for the best solution yeah and then i mean out of your your uh the, the way you as a leader create this environment and get the most out of your team is there a, a an approach or something you do um that we haven't spoken about that you wanted to still add um, um no, i think it's pretty much that what we discussed but I, I have an example of something that like you see it more often as uh, where highly successful companies are are doing this and it's uh it's what this is Anyway, it's so setting like the goals and principles and leaving practices up to the people, um, build trust by taking the first step yourself by being vulnerable. And based on trust, we can have good discussions because people don't mind if they have a different opinion because they trust you that they can have that and they won't get that in their annual feedback. Build on that good discussion, you will get commitment because even if you don't do what they say, but it ends up doing what you say, you've given the opportunity to discuss it. They are committed. They will hold, they will be accountable for it and then they will get results. And then you get to the, you get to that point that because you take care of the people, they take care of you, your customers basically with these results. And this is, this is basically what it comes down to. Um, but this is something that is very easy to explain, but hard to do. So it's not because if it was easy to do, why would not everybody be doing it? And uh, why would not every company be so much more successful? So it, I, I think it also, one thing that I, there's two things that I still wanted to say about it. This is, it's highly, the 
So it's easy to do for some leaders and it's harder to do for some leaders. And I think some leaders are uh, what, and then I go to Lencioni again. He wrote another book that uh, the five dysfunctions of a team is really about the trust and commitment and accountability. And his, his more recent book, The Motive, is about what motivates somebody to be a leader. And if it's if somebody is highly reward focused, so he's then really focused on his status, the money, his level in the company, the number of direct reports. Um, in general, that doesn't that makes it harder to do this approach to leave the details up to the people. And often these people are also more focused on their own manager than on their, on their people. There's another group of leaders who are more responsibility focused. So by nature, they just want to help other people get most of their lives, maybe not even their work. You know, it's just, it's just coincidentally you're working at the same company, but it might even be that you draw the conclusion like, hey, this is not the best place for you, or it would be not ready to do something else. So for these um, responsibility focused people, it's a very easy model to do because they do it naturally. For the reward focused people, and there's a lot, of course, people will never admit that they do that, but a lot of people, it's harder to do. So maybe that's a reason why it's still easy to explain, hard to do. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is that you see it, uh, like, uh, it being discussed more and more as, a, as an approach. And for example, in the, reach, the most recent book of Reed Hastings of Netflix, where they also describe uh, the concept of context uh, instead of control. So give people that context instead of controlling the detail. And well, you have to read the uh, book uh, yourself uh, because, you know, maybe they have another approach to it. But to me, it kind of comes down to the same thing. It's just that I choose my words and these guys choose their words. And it may be a slight difference here and there, but overall it comes down to giving the context and the purpose and then leave the details up to the people over controlling it in detail. Yeah, I think, I mean, that, that wraps up really nicely um, uh, our, I think, most of our conversation, actually, because <laughs> um, this, yeah, I mean, as you said, you know, this, as as a leader, I think it's, or at least I personally really like this inward focus where when when someone makes a bad decision, your first question should be like, what what principle did I not give this person so yeah. that they could have made a better decision? Yeah. Or if they make a bad decision but they don't they don't tell you, it's like okay, what am I doing as a leader that makes them yeah. feel like they can't trust me enough to tell yeah. me? Or I don't know. I can think of many examples, but yeah. I think there's that making it's it's uh, training that muscle as a leader yeah. that you first ask yourself um, where where you went wrong for your team to go wrong. Yeah. Um, and I think that ties really nicely into can you make yourself redundant? Like, can the team function without you for a week? Yeah. If not, then there's still work to be done. Yeah. Um, and I think your yeah, context and details, uh, I really like that idea of giving context and not controlling details. Because again, yeah. it's like when you when you have a, a solution as a leader, don't say, I think we should do this. Always first ask, what do you think we should do? Yeah. Because um, yeah. then you're immediately not controlling the details. And that yeah. is as easy as just changing the question you ask. Um, yeah. So I think yeah. there are some very practical ways of doing it on a day to day. Um, but yeah, Ayen, thank you so much for your insights and experience and knowledge. It was thank such you. a fascinating conversation. I think I, I'm going to try this with some of, um, yeah, even just some of my friends. <laughs> just, yeah. I think this is like good life advice, um, yeah. not only for people who lead dev teams, but yeah, I really, really do appreciate it. It's, uh, it was such a pleasure to get to chat to you as well. Yeah. I've been thank you. thinking about having this conversation for so long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it took a while, but yeah, no, it's, uh, I liked it as well. I liked the, uh, the questions and, you know, with the, the right questions, you start thinking about the answers and that also triggers me again, like, yeah, is this a good answer? Is this actually a good approach? And so it also for me is uh, like uh, doing a conversation like this is also a learning point. Yeah.